Hi, I'm Wayne with Lone Wolf Hot Rods. Years ago, I owned an automotive appraisal company, contracted to a pretty big insurance company, had a bit more than a million accounts, and they only contracted to myself and another company for the majority of their specialty appraisal needs. Muscle cars, collectibles, hot rods, anything that was non-stock or modified. It was a pretty busy place, even for that select group of cars, and I had the opportunity to inspect scores of examples, good and bad. Um, given the experience, I can assure you it's easy to get ripped off simply by being complacent. It actually happened to me too. What I'll show you here are, are several big ways you can get ripped off when you're buying a classic car. Check it out. Number one on my rip-off list is a VIN switch. It's typical for a VIN tag to be riveted on the car. On later model cars, like my Nova, the tag is right here on the driver's side of the dash. You can see it right there through the windshield. Most cars are like this Nova. The rivets aren't visible. But on some Chrysler products, you will see the rivets. The tag is actually riveted to the dash pad. Not a great idea, but I, I'm sure you get the picture. And I'll get the rivets in a second. On older cars, the VIN is often found on the driver's side door jam. I'll just get around here in a sec. And it's found in this location, in the door jam. And it's rivet, they're riveted in place too, and you can actually see the rivets when you when you inspect them. On something like a like a mid-year Corvette, the VIN is on a crossbar underneath the dash, along with the trim tag. If you could see them, the rivets have a rosette pattern. They're not pop rivets. Fair enough. They're easy enough to spot on an older car, but when you get into a later model like car like this Nova, you'd have to take the dash pad off to examine the rivets. But I'm not done yet. There are fake rivets available from a number of different sources. Those fake rivets are pretty darn good, too. What about the hidden VIN? You just check it out. Well, not so fast. Plenty of GMs had the hidden VIN back here behind the heater, or in my case, the heater delete box. It, it, that's where there are two partial VINs located. But to check them when examining a car, you'd have to get the heater box out first. In the vast majority of cases, this means dropping the passenger side inner fender and getting it out of the way first. Then you can remove the AC or heater box or heater delete plate in this case and access the hidden VINs. Not fun. In most cars, it's like a full day's job. But that doesn't get you past all of the crooks. I've examined cars where the dash was cut out Right in this area, just straight back here, and maybe another slice was over here, because in the case car I was looking at. And, and it was replaced with another piece of dash from another car with, of course, another VIN tag. They're very carefully, they very carefully TIG welded and neatly finished. The metal finished the job. It was difficult to find it. In one car I looked at, they even went as far as to cut out this area, right in here. In the firewall so that the hidden VINs were also changed to match the VIN tag that was swapped on the dash. Very clever. Number two on my ripoff list is a bogus trim tag. I don't concern myself much with trim tags on my hot rods because I usually begin with a nothing special six cylinder or small block car. But if you're into numbers matching it's important. First things first. On GMs the body number on the trim tag does not match the VIN in any way. But on plenty of GMs, the only way you can tell if a car is special, such as a Z28 compared to a bare bones V8 coupe, is by way of the trim tag. On something like a 1969 Camaro, a tag with an X33 on it designates a car with a style trim option along with the special performance equipment package, which is a Z28. X77 is for a Z28 without style trim. With Chevys up until 1972, the VIN only tells you if the car is a V8 or a 6 convertible or hardtop or sedan. Bottom line here is a trim tag can be used to legitimize a fake car. But here's the big deal. Trim tags can be swapped. There are a couple of outfits making bogus trim tags and there are also a couple of places where you can get the special rivets for under 20 bucks. They even sell a tool to install the rivet. This is the trim tag on my 1970 Nova. The paint was removed to make it easier to read. Look at the rivets. This tag was never off the car. It's not a special car, just a six cylinder, three on the tree job with no options other than cloth seats. 
There are ways to spot bogus trim tags, but man, there have to be thousands of combinations. The National Corvette Restorer Society even publishes a comprehensive book on spotting fakes for 63 to 67 vets. It's an extremely complex topic. My take is this. If you're buying a special, relatively rare muscle car, and you're paying rare car prices, make sure you have real paperwork that matches the car. That's the easiest way to know what you're buying. Unfortunately, it's also possible in this day and age to fake paperwork. Fake paperwork can include build sheets, window stickers, dealer invoices, and even protecto plates. Bottom line, be absolutely diligent. Probably the best you can do when examining a car is to make absolutely certain the VIN on the car matches the paperwork. And hopefully the car will have sufficient paper to ensure some sort of trail, which you can see here. There's an Ohio title, uh, Indiana title, and a, and, a, and a Canadian title up to the top. And what I look for are copies of these previous titles, original bills of sale, sales transfer paperwork, and if you're really lucky from with a classic GM, a protecto plate. This is the collection from my Nova. Number three on my ripoff list is a rolled odometer. This is an oldie but a goodie, and it's common to the to the used car business. I also have personal experience here too. Maybe 15 years ago, I was in the market for a low mileage turbo Buick, preferably a low auction T type. After a bit of searching, I found one at a dealership out just outside of Dallas. I got a bunch of photos of the car and asked, asked plenty of pertinent questions. The car just seemed so right. Flights were on sale, so I jumped on a plane to check the car out. After I picked up the rental car, we drove north out of the airport to the dealership. I really didn't have to even get out of the car to see it was bogus. The car obviously had way more miles than the speedo and odometer showed, and the dealer claimed ignorance. The dealer was pretty quick to give me my deposit back too. He knew what was going on and he was just looking for a fish. I wasn't that fish. I was I was out a cheap flight and a cheap car rental, along with a couple of meals. Moral of the story here is you can't always trust photos. Next on my ripoff hit list is hidden damage. True story and a confession. I made a mistake. I discovered a really nice dry 1969 Nova out of Colorado a couple of years ago. It was a case of me buying a car sight unseen. I had tons of great photos. It looked really good. The original miles were under 10,000. It was your basic little old lady car. The price certainly wasn't ridiculous. In fact, it was a really good buy and there was little to lose, so I bought it. Getting it home was another lesson and I'll touch on that later. Once I cleaned it up, I noticed something. The driver's side of the car was absolutely perfect. On the passenger side, though, the gap between the door and the quarter panel was a little larger than normal. When I dug around in the trunk, I couldn't find any evidence of quarter panel replacement or repair, so I took out the interior trim and started rooting around. The car was hit all right. It was hit hard on the passenger side, and the body shop spliced the quarter vertically just over the leading edge of the back wheel well. The forward section of the inner wheelhouse was poorly repaired. Meanwhile, the door jam was actually full of filler. After removing the right door panel, it was clear the door had been replaced too. The right front fender was full of Bondo worms and the inner front wheel well was per poorly repaired, but it was hidden under the battery tray. There was a good sized dent on the front subframe and it too was hidden under the battery tray. Once I tore the car right down and had it at a friend's body shop, things proved even worse. A production line quarter panel that I had cut off a known straight Southern Nova didn't fit properly. My Nova was, was hit so hard it moved the lock cylinder support at the back of the car. I checked the front suspension and chassis dimensionally and discovered it wasn't square either. There was one solution, get the shell back and primer and part out the car. It took a while, but it actually came out okay. This isn't a really good example because it's essentially rust free, but, but you'll get the picture. First place to look for, for signs of rust is at the base of the windshield, right here. If you use a flashlight, you should be able to shine it in and see if there's any kind of evidence of rust at the base of the windshield. Once you're done that, continue straight down. Have a look at the front fender right behind the wheel. GM used a flush and dry rocker panel system and what happens is that the system fills up with leaves and debris and just the, the flush and dry panels are blocked and they rust right there. Follow the rocker panel length of the door, keep watching for bubbles or any evidence of damage. Open the door, have a look inside, check out the rocker panels. And check out the door jam itself. 
actual doors are a real source of trouble for these cars or multiple panel construction and, and the, the drain holes can become blocked. Have a close look at them. Check it out carefully. You might have to, you might have to lay down underneath the car to have a look at them. Continue along the car. Have a look at the rear quarter panels. Again, look for rust or any signs of damage. Trunk lid open. Suggest you look at the base of the windshield. Pardon me, back window right in here. Uh, when the seals go bad and weather stripping goes bad and the leak and the rain and water will get caught in there and you'll end up with rust. With the trunk open, you have a good opportunity to check for rust. Quarter panels are easy to access here. That's usually where you can spot the, any previous damage or, or botched repairs. Same applies to the floor pan. This is all original in this car and has no damage. Both sides. Final place to look is, is, is in the interior. Have a look under the under the mat if you can get there. If you can gain access, you might again have to go under the car, but to check the floor pans. If the car has uh, a vinyl uh, floor trim rather than carpet, they are susceptible to rust. Uh, if you can pull the trim back or vinyl trim back and have a look, great. If not, you'll have to climb under the car to check for rust on the floor pans, front, both front sides and even behind the front seats. Next up on my list are two related items, junk parts and shoddy workmanship. Let's look at the parts end of the equation first. In today's world, there's no shortage of reproduction parts for, for cars and an equally large number of high performance and race car parts. No secret to anyone, I'm sure. But what you really have to consider is the amount of real junk that's masquerading out there as quality product. There's a ton of it out there and, and it can range from replacement jobber parts to speed equipment. As expected, most of the real junk can be traced back to China. Unfortunately, when you get to the you get to, to buy parts, there's there's no way of really knowing what the source is until you really get the parts out of the package and in your hands. What's worse though is the fact some people use these junk parts on cars wittingly or unwittingly. A good example of simple junk is of all things the spindle castle nut and washer assembly, along with the dust cap. There's a very common 1969 Camaro style disc brake front spindle pieces. Uh, the spindle's common to Camaros, Nova, Chevelles, and countless other GM products. This nice looking castle nut shown here is a reproduction. The notches are manufactured too shallow. I suspect it came from China. This means that you have to tighten the nut more to reach the respective holes in the spindle. To make matters worse, the washer is too big, almost one hundred thousandths of an inch too big in diameter. This means you can't put the dust cap on. It makes contact with the washer as you tap it in place. As you tap down the dust cap, the washer in turn tightens up the bearing clearance. That was just a small example. There have to be thousands of cases out there where the parts are simply built wrong or built with the wrong materials. Equally bad is shoddy workmanship. Case in point is my green Nova. It's a very nice car that was subframe off restored before I got it. I drove it for a while with the six and three on the tree. The trips weren't long, maybe 15 minutes to half an hour or so, but they're excruciating. The car was pig slow, even by six cylinder standards, and stopping was worse. When I, when I took it apart to, to build my hot rod, I discovered the cause of some of the issues. This short clip is, is how I had to take the back brake drums off. You'll find it interesting.
When it came apart, it was pretty clear the springs were attached incorrectly in the brakes. The adjusters were seized. Up front, things weren't any better. I had to cut one of the drums off as well because the adjuster was seized. Worth's, uh, both front brakes were soaked in grease. Apparently, whoever assembled the front end didn't know the difference between general purpose grease and high temperature wheel bearing grease. I found many things done correctly on the car, and they were done well, but I also found a lot of things that were done wrong. It was clear that when someone who knew what they were doing was working on the car, things were done very right. But when someone who didn't have a clue was working on the car, things were done very wrong. And this might be typical of more than one collector car out there. The final thing I want to mention is rip-off transportation. When I bought that Bent Nova out of Colorado, I had to get the car delivered. The dealer also figured they could get me a discount on the transport cost. Bonus! I booked the transport through the dealer, and my big stipulation was that the same folks who owned the transport company would haul the car. Going in, I knew that the car would be torn down in short order and repainted. Because of that, I decided the $600 difference between an enclosed and an open hauler wasn't worth it. I went with the open hauler. I stipulated that the car be loaded at the front of the trailer. So far, so good. I had a telephone number of the transport company. They provided me with the cell phone number of the driver. I was to make contact a day or so into the hall to arrange the drop-off. The driver was a day late picking up the car. Thus far, I was still talking to the original trucking company dispatcher. I chalked it up to weather. 49 states had snow that winter, but soon things started to unravel. I made contact with who I thought was the driver. His accent easily gave him away as a Russian expat. I couldn't hear any truck or traffic in the background. As it turns out, he wasn't the driver at all. He is, instead, he was supposedly the dispatcher for another trucking company. Somehow my stipulation about who hauled the car was ignored. The car hauling outfit I had contracted with through the dealer had subcontracted the job. Things were going from bad to worse. I live on an island. To speed up the process, I made arrangements to meet the transport on the mainland on a specific date. I rented a trailer from U-Haul, hooked it to my pickup truck, and jumped on the ferry. When I reached the meeting point, I called the dispatcher again. The response was dismal, in a heavy accent. She be late. I tried to determine how late late really was. The dispatcher couldn't say or wouldn't say. To make a long story short, the truck eventually ended up being 72 hours late. I had to stay in a hotel room for three nights waiting for the car. The car ended up being delivered at dark o'clock on a Sunday morning. Worse, the driver barely spoke English. The Nova was top loaded all right, loaded at the very back of the open trailer, where it was blasted by salt and sand for the better part of a week. It looked absolutely filthy. Inside, it wasn't much better, and it looked like the Nova's trunk was used to haul stuff. There was a considerable amount of broken Bakelite in the trunk. Where that came from is anyone's guess. And to throw salt in my wound, one tire was almost flat and the gas tank was bone dry. But before the car could be unloaded, the driver and the co-driver demanded a $500 unloading fee. With that in mind, I pulled out my cell phone and asked both of them if 911 was the right number for the police. As I started to punch in the numbers, they both proclaimed, we make a mistake. The two eventually saw the error of their ways and helped push the Nova to my truck and trailer. In the end, because of staying in a hotel room for three nights, meals, trailer rental for an extra three days, and missing a day of work, I was out well in excess of $800, over and above the original quote to move the car. That doesn't take into account the fact I had at least a dozen different delivery times scheduled over a three-day period. Stress with me was eating me alive, and at one point, late Saturday, I was sure the car was stolen, and my contact at the trucking company I originally had contracted with conferred. I could have used a big name reliable hauler to move the car and it would have been enclosed. The truth is, getting ripped off buying a classic car is pretty easy. I've just skimmed the surface here. In the end, don't allow you to, yourself to be starstruck in, in, in any way, shape or form. Brace yourself for worst case scenarios. There are a lot of crooks out there and they certainly know their way into your wallet.